Curiosity killed the cat. Who's here have heard that saying? Okay, basically everyone in the room, yeah. This saying, actually, it's a very old saying. It can be traced back all the way to the 16th century. That's a very long time. I personally have a very, um, I, don't, I don't like that saying a lot. Because, one, it undermines our natural capacity as humans to be able to think critically and to challenge assumptions. And on the other hand, curiosity has been something that has shaped my entire life, all the way to what I do today as a behavioral engineer, where I use curiosity to help people create technology that is inclusive. So if we want to think about having a world where there are no biases, there's no discrimination, at least from the technological side, we need to start thinking about how we use curiosity. Because you see, curiosity is not just a thing that um, makes you want to learn more, it's not just your desire to have more knowledge, it's actually this incredible thing that has shaped us as humans, our history, all the way from starting from the, the, creation, the invention of fire to self-driving cars or anything that comes after. And it all starts with one question. So if you think about it, why, why do we have to wait for um, pictures to be developed? And so Polaroid was invented. Or just thinking about why does a, an apple fall from the tree? And so we have gravity. So these questions are the things that have determined our breakthroughs, our innovations. And without it, we wouldn't have them. I find myself to be a very curious person. I actually, um, I ask so many why and what ifs. When I meet someone, I actively warn them that I will be asking them a lot of questions. And I don't do this because I just want to be polite and I will stop asking questions. I actually do this because I will ask the questions, but I want to make them know that they'll feel uncomfortable. Because we do feel uncomfortable when someone asks us questions, especially that make us think critically. And to be honest, it is a lot of fun. So um, the thing about curiosity that we sometimes don't think is that it works like we're receiving a gift. So curiosity makes our reward system work. So we start releasing dopamine. So it's almost like we're expecting this um, information, which is like this gift that we're gonna be receiving. And that release of dopamine in our brains feels so incredible. So I wanna tell you a bit about my story. I come from a family where I was highly encouraged to be curious. Um, science and engineering were at the core. And my mom and dad, all they wanted me to do is ask questions. And if I had a question, they will give me books. They will get me someone that specialized in the subject that they knew to help me so I can ask more questions until I had no more questions to ask. So you can imagine when I asked my mom and dad where the babies come from. Um, <laughs> I definitely did not get the birds and the bees talk. I actually got my mom to call her sister, who's a biology professor, so she could explain to me the process, the biological process of creating life. So that was my childhood. On the other hand, um, when you are so curious, sometimes it doesn't work that well when you're at school. I was heavily bullied. I also had no friends. And this was from the teachers and from the students, especially from the teacher on my favorite class, which was at the time biology. I've always been into science. And the interesting thing is that I've actually found a lot of people, my friends, from different countries, different parts of the world, different cultures, that the same thing has happened to them. They have been shamed. They have been punished for being too curious or for asking too many questions. Actually, if you think about, um, we're supposed to, to reach our peak of asking questions and curiosity when we're four or five. And by that time, uh, on average, kids ask roughly 107 questions per hour. That's a lot, right? 
But the thing is that when they go into school, that number drops, just completely drops, all the way to actually progressively, they stop asking questions to the point that they don't ask questions anymore. So if anyone here is a professor or a lecturer, I'm sure you understand how frustrating that is when you're teaching your, those young adults and they're not asking you any questions, yeah? So the thing about it is that it's not just when we're kids. When we grow up, leaders, is they say, that they want to have curious minds. But the reality is that what research shows is that leaders in companies, they think that curiosity is risky and also curiosity is inefficient. And it is true that curiosity can be scary because it's exploring the unknown. But on the other side of the spectrum, the reality is that curiosity, companies that foster curiosity in the workplace actually adapt faster and they perform better. And this is critical in today's, today's age because there's digital disruption and we need to really quickly adapt. So, we truly have to start thinking about curiosity differently. And the way that I would like to explain curiosity to you, what we should be doing, is to one, have proactive curiosity, so we get people to actively ask questions and encourage them to do it, since they're kids, all the way to the grown-ups. And the other thing is to think about empathetic curiosity. Because the thing is that it's not only about how you ask questions or what questions you ask, but also about how you receive them. And are you ready to receive them? And this is where the empathy comes from. So you have to think about people's intersectionality, so gender, race. And you also have to think about people's backgrounds and how those things relate to someone's perspective. Because even though you might have two people that look obviously the same and maybe come from the same country and they're the same gender, that doesn't mean that they have the same lived experiences. And by default, they will not have the same experiences or they will not have the same needs from technology. I, for example, I come from a country called Venezuela, uh, which is in South America and the Caribbean. And in my country, I've been called a black lady. And a lot of you guys just frowned, and I'm sure a lot of you, a lot of you, it makes you cringe. But the thing is that what a lot of you might not know is that in my country, we deal with race differently. Even though I look white on the outside, in my, where I come from, we um, calling someone a black lady is a term of endearment. It's a beautiful thing to say to someone. And it's not based on the color of your skin. There's a lot of historical reasons for that. So have, please go and ask questions and be curious. But we need to understand these differences everywhere. And for that, we need to be ready to accept that someone will have a different lived experience that we do. So we have to strip down of our biases and everything that we know, so we can take in as much information we can. Because it is so important when we're creating technology. If you think about AI, for example, or machine learning, the way they work is that they make decisions based on what we teach them. And if we teach them information that is one dimensional, so I just tell them about my gender, or I just tell them just where I come from. If we just, you don't we teach them information that is biased, they will make decisions based on that information. So they work exactly like kids or us, we get information and we learn it. But the problem is that technology accelerates it and also makes it into a bigger scale. So that means that anything that we create that have those biases will be accelerated and the negative impact will increase exponentially. So we have to be able to see humans as multi-dimensional beings and always think about context. I have a friend that he was in a software, um, software engineering company and they had a day where they were allowed to create any technology they wanted. So the team decided to create this program that we have facial recognition. And when they came into the office, they would greet them. Hi, good morning. And they would say the name of the person. What happened is that once they created it, um, my friend, the team that created it was all white. And he was the only black person in the room. And even though 
the team that created it was diverse, um, the result was that the program did not identify my friend. Because, like he said, he was a dark, a sh a dark shade of black. So even though sometimes in companies you think, oh, if we have a diverse team, yes, it will help because the, uh, the question was asked afterwards, but the technology was already created. So in this case, it's not that impactful because we're just talking about a small program that will greet you in the morning, didn't identify you, okay. But can you imagine this at a larger scale? How will this affect us? And discrimination because of gender or, or, or race or color of your skin, those are more obvious. Then we have algorithms that are also discriminating because of association. So it could be something as simple as you not getting alone because of where you live, who you hang out with, and even just if you own a dog or not. So we really need to start adding these dimensions uh, to these algorithms because they are everywhere at this moment. This is not the future, this is now. We're using these algorithms and these complex programs to automate things like housing, things like loans, all the way to the criminal system. And so we need to start thinking of people about this in this multi-dimensional way. And for that, we need to ask questions and we need to be curious because otherwise we wouldn't know. I want to give you my favorite example, which is about a car. It's a self-driving car. So a self-driving car is a car that will make the decisions for you. You're not driving, you're inside, it will drive you. So it has to be programmed to make decisions, where to steer, if you have to go right, left. So imagine that you're in that self-driving car and you're about to crash. And it's, impos it's impossible for you not to crash, it's inevitable. You will crash. But you have two options. You can steer to the left and in that situation, you will kill a child. You'll steer to the right, and in that situation, you'll kill an elderly person. Who do you save? So what I find interesting is that research, what they found, um, MIT did a research about this, and what they found is that we as humans tend to choose the younger person and women. So also this varies if you come from a different country, um, they, they choose the all elderly person, because again, culture, but the, the, the rule is that people will choose young people and, and children, and, and women, sorry. So if you have that self, same self-driving car, and there'll be a man and a woman, same age, that by default means that the car learned that every time the woman will be safe. So in this scenario, men get killed every single time. That's that, just to think about that is horrendous and unfair. So you can't think about these decisions in one dimension. Let's add more dimensions to this. So what about is a person is influential, right? Will you choose a person that is influential in the community or the person who's not influential? What makes a person influential? For starters, is it like if it's a president? What, is, what does that even mean? And as I'm asking you this, have you thought about what happens to you inside the car? Are you supposed to be saved? And what determines that you're saved? Luckily, at this point in time, it's not legal to actually um, program, all, program the self-driving cars to choose who make, to make decisions based on how we look um, and physical characteristics. But there will come a day where these cars, and it's not in the far future, this is happening soon, that these cars are going to be out there making decisions. And we have to make sure that we ask enough questions so these decisions are fair and not only protecting one group. And I love this example because it's an impossible example. It's so difficult and heartbreaking just to think that someone has to put uh, and create this, these rules that we do naturally as humans. But we have to really, these questions, we ask them ourselves and we have to really think about them when we're creating this technology. So ask, ask, because technology, creating technology is a process. I'm never saying if people wait to ask all the questions and then get the technology out there, it will take too long. But it's not about getting it right the first time, 
It's about being open to ask the question and see what can we improve. Like in the case of my friend, they asked the questions and that's when, it, when they saw the result, they saw it. And then they asked the question, how can we improve it? And we really need to think about this process when we're creating any type of technology. So I want to invite you to be more curious and to start removing yourself from biases and start feeling comfortable with the idea of being incorrect and actually thinking that's something very fun. And even if you're not incorrect, maybe you're not 100% right. And thinking, I can really add value and have more information and feel good about it, about being wrong. Be ready to be uncomfortable and to make other people feel uncomfortable. It's also a lot of fun. <laughs> and listen, really, truly listen. Because if we want to create a fair world that is equal for everyone, where technology is helping everyone, we need you, it's up to you to ask the questions and give the perspective that will create this technology. Curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. Thank you.